Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is the preface and foreword. So the preface is written by Stephen Kipfer. By the time Dialectical Materialism was published in 1939, Henry Lefebvre had already lived through 20 rich years of intellectual and political engagement. In the 1920s, after arriving in Paris from Aix-en-Provence to study philosophy at the Sorbonne, Lefebvre joined a proto-existentialist student group, Jeune Philosophe, and critically engaged works by Schelling, Proust, Pascal, Nietzsche, and his two main university teachers. Maurice Blondel and Leon Bruchvik. Influenced by re rebellious avant-garde's and some of their exponents, Dada, Tristan Sara, and Surrealism, André Breton, Lefebvre became politically active. He faced military confinement after protesting the French army's campaign against the Moroccan Rif in 1925 and joined the French Communist Party, PCF, in 1928. He subsequently developed his understanding of Marx and Hegel in debates with his fellow travelers, Breton, Jean Wall, Paul Niesen, Norbert Guterman, George Pulitzer, in such journals as La Revue Mar Marxiste, <laughs> An avant post. Of great intellectual importance was Lefebvre's collaborative work with Norbert Guterman, with whom he published generously commented translations of Hegel, Lenin's Hegel notebooks, and Marx's early work, including the 1844 manuscripts. These translation projects were key for the intellectual genesis not only of dialectical materialism, but Hegelian Marxism in France more generally. Dialectical materialism was the culmination of Lefebvre's interwar activities, which were brought to an end by World War II and the resistance against the Vichy regime. In this context, the book had to highlight the tension fraught relationship between Lefebvre and the PCF. Even though he served as a communist municipal councillor in the mid 1930s, Lefebvre found himself still in the periphery of the PCF before the war, in comparison to Pulitzer, for example. This was partly because, for Lefebvre, Marxism was above all a dynamic movement of theory and practice, not a fixed doctrine and instrument for party strategy. Despite the identical title, Lefebvre's dialectical materialism is thus not to be confused with the dialectical materialism of the common turn. Rather, it is best seen as an implicit but pesky rejoinder to Joseph Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism. In this article, which was published a year before, Lefebvre's book, Stalin, which was published a year before Lefebvre's book, Stalin had declared dialectical materialism the world outlook of the Marxist-Leninist party. Based on a narrow and schematic reading of Engels's Dialectics of Nature and Anti-During, Stalin's dialectical materialism combined a nominally dialectical philosophy of nature with a mechanical conception of materialism, complete with a reflection theory of consciousness. Diamat was meant to furnish a science of the history of society akin to the natural sciences, historical materialism, that could provide party leaders with an un unerring approach to policy. Implicit as it was, Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's response to official party doctrine brought him heat from party bigwigs and from sectarian dogmatists for indulging in Hegelian idealism and neglecting the influence of French socialism and British political economy on the development of Marxist thought. Before publishing Dialectical Materialism, Lefebvre had already garnered criticism from other communist intellectuals for some of his theoretical activities. Most controversial among these were Lefebvre's and Guterman's comments on Lenin's Hegel notebooks, 
which demonstrated the importance of Hegel's dialectical method for Lenin. Both this exegesis <laughs> of Lenin, I can't pronounce that word, and dialectical materialism underlines the continued, if thoroughly transformed, presence of Hegel in the mature works of Marx and Lenin. They had to ruffle feathers among party officials, both in France and in the common turn, who were trained to believe, following Stalin's reduction of Marxism to the doctrinaire diamat, that Marx, Engels, and Lenin had to be rigorously shielded from the new humanist problematics of alienation in Marx's early works. In fact, criticism of his work and consequent intellectual isolation in the late 1930s help explain Lefebvre's ultimate ultimately futile decisions in the immediate post-war period to modify the edges of his theoretical arguments, provide officious critiques of Sartre and existentialism in 1946, and engage in an exercise of self-criticism in 1949. Dialectical materialism contains three major engagements. Drawing from Hegel's major works, but emphasizing the science of logic, Lefebvre begins with an ex exposition of Hegel's dialectical treatment of logic. Hegel's con contribution stands in contrast with traditional formal logic, which seeks to determine the workings of the intellect independently of the experimental, and hence particular and contingent content of every concrete ass assertion. Hegel's dialectical logic was not intended to abolish formal logic, but to transcend it by searching for a consciousness of an infinitely rich unity of thought and reality, of form and content. Dialectical logic is meant to be both method of analysis and recreation of the movement of the real through a movement of thought. Lefebvre is highly respectful of Hegel's undertaking and stresses the distance between Hegel's and Kant's philosophical dualisms of form and content thought and thing in itself, knowledge and objects of knowledge. Hegel brilliantly sets out to avoid one-sided treatments of the relationship between form and content, incorporating both in an immense epic of the mind, where each moment of reality and thought is sublated, abolished, preserved, and transformed in a dialectical movement of becoming. While dialectical logic retains its validity as a method, according to Lefebvre, Hegel's overall project ultimately fails, even on its own terms. Rather than achieving a moving unity of thought and reality, form and content, Hegel's logic remains caught within the alienated movements of the mind. As a result, it ends up as a formalism in its own right. Instead of expressing and reflecting the movement of the content, the dialectic produces this movement, thus functioning less as a method of analysis than as a way to construct the content synthetically and systematically. But enveloping content with a predetermined method yields closure, not dialectical openness. It is no longer a matter of raising the content freely to the notion, but of finding in the content a certain form of the notion, posited a priori in relation to the content, circular, enclosed, and total in a special sense of that word, to wit as a closed totality. Hegel's dialectical logic produces an abstract self-referential systematization aimed at a terminal point where contradictions are resolved in, in spirit, the absolute idea. It becomes an austere dogma that is distant from the trials of worldly experience. To overcome Hegelianism on its own terms, it is necessary, according to Lefebvre, to accept the rich content of life in all its immensity, nature, spontaneity, action, widely differing cultures, fresh problems. This content may swamp our minds, but we must open our minds to it nonetheless. This preliminary critique of Hegel provides the basis for the second and most important part of dialectical materialism. Lefebvre's argument about the relationship between Hegel and Marx. According to Lefebvre, Marx dealt with Hegel's legacy in two phases. 
In his early work, most notably the Economic Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844 and the German Ideology from 1845 to 46, which he wrote with Engels, Marx lays the foundation for historical materialism. In the manuscripts, he takes Hegel's phenomenology of mind to task for misunderstanding alienation as objectification of the mind, rather than as a form of material dispossession. While mistaking alienated life, religion, law, philosophy for real life. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels applaud Ludwig Feuerbach's initial critique of Hegel's idealism while criticizing his naturalistic, undialectical materialism and his abstract conception of man as a social being. Feuerbach thus fails to place man and things within the web of social relations through which man transforms nature, produces history, and in class society gets separated, alienated from the fruits of his productive activity and fellow humans. Both Farbach and Max Stirner fail to see that their starting point, the isolated private individual, is itself a product of alienation and reification. According to Lefebvre, Marx and Engels' critique of Farbach and Stirner most fully develops historical materialism as a unity of idealism and materialism. Lefebvre suggests that, is, that at this point, Marx still has a negative conception of Hegel's science of logic. In The Poverty of Philosophy in 1847 and The Communist Manifesto in 1848, Marx denigrates Hegel's dialectical logic as wholly abstract, purely formal, and entirely incompatible with a materialist conception of humanity. As he announced in a letter to Engels in 1858, Marx returned to Hegel's dialectical logic only while working on the preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy in 1859 and capital in 1867. Only there does Marx properly sublate Hegel's logic, according to Lefebvre. In these later works, idealism and materialism are not only reunited, but transformed and transcended. This yields a dialectical materialism that does not remain the external opposite of idealism, as in Stalin's formulation, but rather incorporates and transforms both Hegel and Marx's initial critique of idealism. After debasing dialectical logic in his early works, Marx thus integrates the dialectical method of exposition into historical materialism, thereby elevating the latter to a new level. This is most clearly the case in Capital, where the study of economic phenomena rests on the dialectical movement of the categories. In its various manifestations, cap Capital can be grasped as a concrete abstraction, a contradictory fusion of content and form, concreteness and abstraction, quality and quantity, use value and exchange value. In the process, the commodity, money, or capital, more generally, end up weighing down on human relations, even though they are the expression of these very relations. By registering this in his analysis of commodity fetishism, Marx raises the theories of alienation and reification to a higher level. In Unity of the Doctrine, Lefebvre summarizes dialectical materialism. The materialist dialectic accords primacy to content and being over form and thought. It provides a method of analysis for the movement of this content and a reconstruction of the total movement, identifying laws of development within which to place each historical situation. Finally, it incorporates living men into the objective reality of history. In contrast to Hegel's dialectical logic, the materialist dialectic is neither formalistic nor closed. Treating categories and concepts as elaborations of the actual content and as abbreviations of the infinite mass of particularities of concrete existence, the materialist dialectic does not remain external to content. More Hegelian than Hegelianism, it restores the inner unity of dialectical thought. This dialectic is open-ended and does not seek premature closure. The exposition of dialectical materialism does not pretend to put an end to the forward march of knowledge or to offer a closed totality 
of which all previous systems had been no more than it than the inadequate expression. No expression of dialectical materialism can be definitive, but instead of being incompatible and conflicting with each other, it may perhaps be possible for these expressions to be integrated into an open totality, perpetually in the process of being transcended, precisely insofar as they will be expressing the solutions to the problems facing concrete man. Dialectical materialism refuses to enclose knowledge within a te teleological search for the absolute idea, which for Hegel was eventually actualized in a reformed Prussian state. In contrast to Hegel's dialectical logic, it is no longer a dogma. For dialectical materialism, the central reference point is not the internal movement of mind, but praxis, that is the total activity of mankind, action and thought, physical labor and knowledge. As a result, the moments of transformation that define dialectical movement become part of the struggles and contradictions of living actuality. The praxis is where dialectical materialism both starts and finishes. The word itself denotes in philosophical terms what common sense refers to as real life, that life which is at once more prosaic and more dramatic than that of the speculative intellect. Dialectical materialism's aim is nothing less than the rational expression of the praxis or the actual content of life, and correlatively the transformation of the present praxis into a social practice that is conscious, coherent, and free. Its theoretical aim and its practical aim, knowledge and creative action, cannot be separated. Lefebvre's an encompassing notion of praxis represents the starting point for the final third component of the book, the production of man. There he, fur he furnishes a materialist formulation of humanism that borrows liberally from Marx's own views in the 1844 manuscripts. Accordingly, man, while a natural and biological being at heart, creates his own nature by acting on nature. Key in this process of producing man is the activity of human labor, which in its various incarnations articulates both physical and spiritual, objective and subjective dimensions of existence. Human labor, human labor forms the basis for consciousness, which as an activity of integration is not a me mechanical reflection of material forces, but becomes an integral part of production and the human nature metabolism itself. Placing consciousness within the very dynamics of human labor, Lefebvre is careful to distinguish broad from narrow notions of production. He warns that the activity of production and social labor must not be understood in terms of the non-specialized labor of the manual worker only. To do so would be to miss creative or poetic aspects of production and accept a historically specific productivist notion of production as a transhistorical given. Lefebvre's notion of produced humanity is thus not to be confused with Homo Faber, that creature of inhuman conditions which reduce human capacities to purely utilitarian instrumental activities. Defying such productivism, <clears throat> which characterized the Stalinist dialectical materialism he responded to, he responded to Lefebvre's materialist humanism ushers in a vision of total man. To speak with Marx's manuscripts, total man has fully appropriated his multiple potentials and variegated capacities. As de-alienated man, total man is worlds apart from the actually existing economic man, or homo faber. Economic man is alienated insofar as his multiple faculties are torn apart by proletarianization, class society, money, state, and ideology, Lefebvre argues with the help of the manifesto, the poverty of philosophy and capital. Under these circumstances, humans' potential for freedom is denied by the seemingly independent nature, like nature-like determinism of economic forces. If incompatible with economic man, total man is also not to be identified with theoretical man, Lefebvre argues, citing Nietzsche. The rationalism of theoretical man is itself a form of alienation. It signals a separation between the bourgeois, cultural, and rational, 
man and the proletarian, natural and practical man. Unlike the overconfident, oddly voluntarist, Stalinist dialectical materialist, for whom the world and its laws are fully knowable, total man knows the limits of consciousness and reason. Man's consciousness expresses his authority over things, but also his limitation, since it can be attained only by way of abstraction and logic, and in the consciousness of the theoretical man who is alien to nature. Lefebvre warns against asserting reason to control what escapes humanity's practical and theoretical control, nature, chance, spontaneity, the, the unconscious. To impose rational control over this uncontrolled sector of life risks reactivating reason as myth. Given the impossibility of purely theoretical knowledge, total man is thus best captured with reference to art. Liberated from the restrictions of the division of labor, while reduced, which reduce art to a specialized activity, artistic practice, music, painting, poetry, promises a form of action that unites reason with nature, rationality with spontaneity. Understood as everyday creativity, art points to the possibility of a productive form of labor, freed from the characteristic of alienation, actualizing the unity of the product and the producer, of the individual and the social, of natural being and the human being. In Dialectical Materialism, Lefebvre paints a picture of Marx's work as a moving, open-ended, and concrete totality, a view that he re reiterated throughout his life. One may say Lefebvre's own extensive life work, too, resembles a fluid constellation of concepts tied together by cross-cutting methodological concerns, political orientations, and rich, if controversial, life experiences. Each concept can be understood in relation to the overall conceptual constellation and the common concerns, orientations, and experiences which help recompose it. Lefebvre's theoretical and political trajectories underwent shifts and transformations, such as the, th the thematic shift to the urban in the late 1950s and the break with the PCF in 1958. Yet they remain remarkably consistent. It is not possible to identify an epistemological break in Lefebvre's work. As Christian Schmidt has pointed out, Lefebvre's work as a whole is characterized by, by an emphatic relationship to politics and poesy, a radical critique of, of philosophy and institutional practices of academic research, an original understanding of dialectical method, and an unconventional approach to Marxism. These common and consistent strands in Lefebvre's work, which one can find already encapsulated in in dialectical materialism are not only incompatible with the orthodoxies of the third international, they remain at a distance from the two key rival currents in 20th century French philosophy, existentialism, and above all, structuralism. Dialectical materialism represents a formidable access point to Lefebvre's overall work and the development of his Marxism. Taking up points made with Gutermann in the Comment commentaries on Hegel, Marx and Lenin, dialectical materialism was to be the starting point for an eight-volume project on dialectical materialism. While, par while party censorship meant that only the introduction to this series was published at the time, Logique Formelle, Logique Dialectique, 1947, the critique of philosophy Lefebvre put forward from the late 1930s to the 1940s was recast after his exit from the PCF, most prominently in La Somme et le Reste in 1959 and Metaphilosophie in 1965, Sociology of Marx in 1966, and Le Retour de la Dialectique in 1986. In these works, one finds an open formulation of Marxism that owes much to the critique of closed totalities and the aversion to schematic notions of dialectical method and dialectical materialism. Accordingly, Marxism represents as much intellectual and political potential as fully worked out achievement 
to develop this potential dialectical materialism in later works present a Marx whose work remains porous to other, particularly Hegelian and, to a lesser extent, Nietzschean influences. In fact, the comments on art and theoretical man that conclude dialectical ma materialism take up Lefebvre's earlier engagements with surrealism and represent an opening to Nietzsche that parallels Lefebvre's almost simultaneously published qualified defense of the German philosopher against his Nazi interpreters, meant both as a counterpoint to Hegelian rationalism and an expansion of Marxism, this tension-ridden and arguably less successful attempt to link a Hegelian Marx to Nietzsche continued to preoccupy Lefebvre throughout his life. Dialectical materialism also gives us a glimpse into two other characteristics of Lefebvre's Marxism. It's in its integral integrality and its qualified humanism. Lefebvre's attempt to develop a, a materialism that is transformed and incorporated idealism within itself points to an encompassing, multifaceted understanding of Marxism. Dialectical materialism has room for philosophical elaboration, cultural critique, and historical materialist investigation all at once. It integrates but cannot remain political economy. As Lefebvre himself argues in the pages of Dialectical Materialism, the first of Marx's great investigations into economics was a critique of political economy. If we want to understand the fundamentals of this thought, this word critique must be taken in its widest sense. Political economy, like religion, has got to be criticized and transcended. The social mystery is fetishist and religious in nature. Political economy is a threefold alienation of man in the errors of economists who take the momentary results of human relations to be permanent categories in natural laws as a science of a substantial object external to man as a reality and an economic destiny. This alienation is real. It sweeps away living men, yet it is only the manifestation of these men, their external appearance, their alienated essence. For as long as human relations are contradictory, for as long, that is, as man are divided into classes, the solution of this contradiction will appear and deploy itself as something external, eluding our activity and consciousness, economic mechanisms, states and institutions, ideologies. Lefebvre keeps insisting on Marx's critique of political economy at various points in his work, because for him, a communist orientation cannot take for granted humanity as it, rep as, it rep as it presents itself in the here and now. The full development of human possibilities, which is the goal of dialectical materialism, requires not an uncritical liberal bourgeois affirmation, but a thorough transformation of humans in their actual alienated state as workers or intellectuals. In Lefebvre, an integral approach to Marxism as a critique of political economy thus has as its corollary a humanism he qualified variously as revolutionary, new, or dialectical. The openness, integrality, and dialectical humanism of Lefebvre's Marxism one can detect in dialectical materialism ushers in his most enduring of projects, the critique of everyday life. Already in the early 1930s, Lefebvre undertook sociological research on industrial working class life and wrote analyses of fascism, nationalism, and individualism. Of obvious rel relevance for investigations into everyday life, these themes were brought together under the rubric of mystification in La, Conscien La Cons Conscience Conscience Mystifée. 1936, the collaboration with Guterman that develops Marx's critique of commodity fetishism, fetishism and parallels Lucas's critique of reification. At a more decisively meta-theoretical level, dialectical materialism prepares important grounds for Lefebvre's critique of everyday life, which appeared between 1947 and 1992. The clue to this is his discussion of alienation in dialectical materialism, which, as Lefebvre says, starts from man as actual and active, from the actual process of living. Neither an objectification of mind, as in Hegel, nor a purely economic category of exploitation, 
Lefebvre sees alienation as an everyday experience of the labor process, utilitarian economic organization, individualism, and the division between intellectual and productive labor. A critique of alienation thus cannot stand apart from this, these everyday experiences, as Lucas's history and class consciousness tend to do, or tended to do. It must learn from them in an active engagement with the contradictions and conflicts of living subjects. This remains true even if the notion of alienation is further expanded to analyze consumerism, the role of women, state socialist society, and the situation of colonial countries, as Lefebvre urges us to do in 1961 in the foreword to the fifth edition of Dialectical Materialism, which appeared at the same time as the second volume of the Critique of Everyday Life. Lefebvre's understanding of Marxism and his critique of everyday life do not allow for compartmentalization of critical social research and Lefebvre's own work into cultural studies and political economy. There is no clearer indication of this than Lefebvre's distinction between instrumental forms of production tied up with capitalism and the production of life, human nature, and art, more broadly speaking. Developed extensively first in dialectical materialism, this broad understanding of production recurs in Lefebvre's work. It informed his persistent critique of productivism in capitalism, bourgeois society, and various statist traditions of the left, Stalinism, social democracy, and Euro-communism. This critique is central to Lefebvre's approach to the state and his work on urbanization and space. Analogous to Marx's critique of the commodity in Capital, the production of space from 1974, for example, provides a critique of reified notions of space as thing-like object. For an effective critique of such notions of space, Lefebvre presents a theory of the production of space that may include but greatly exceeds a geographical, political, economic research program. Accordingly, social space is considered a result of three processes of production material practices of reproduction, forms of conception bound by ideology and institutional knowledge, and more fluid forms of symbolic representation and everyday imagination. These three processes relate to each other in an open-ended dialectical fashion. The production of space is ultimately a critique of how state, capital, rationalist knowledge, and phallocentric symbolism produce an abstract form of space. This critique takes up and develops Lefebvre's earlier urban works and their critique of urbanism, the state-bound specialists, planners, architects, developers, technocrats, who conceive of and produce the abstract spatial environments that end up imposing themselves onto our everyday lives. To these forms of producing, manufacturing, objects in space, Lefebvre counterposed <clears throat> forms of urban social space that are created akin to products that result from multifaceted, multisensory art-like labor. The right to the city from 1968, um, the eruption, the explosion from 1968, la manifeste differentialiste from 1970, and the urban revolution from 1978, or, no, 1970, su suggested that in a rapidly urbanizing society, a quest for a life beyond alienation is now best understood as a struggle for the city as oeuvre, a collectively produced work of art. The potential of everyday art as unalienated labor, highlighted in dialectical materialism, reappears in the form of the Commune of 1871 and May 1968 which are reinterpreted as specifically urban aspirations, revolutionary struggles of peripher peripheralized social groups for the social surplus, political power, and spatial centrality. This example shows more clearly than any others how the themes in dialectical materialism continue to endure together with Lefebvre's explosive critiques of state, everyday life, and urban space. The Forward to the Fifth Edition This little book represents an episode in the fierce struggle inside and outside Marxism between the dogmatists and the critique of dogmatism. This struggle is not over, it goes bitterly on.
Dogmatism is strong. It can call on the force of authority of the state and its institutions. Moreover, it has advantages. It is simple and easily taught. It steers clear of complex problems, this being precisely the aim and meaning of dogmatism. It gives its adherents a feeling of both vigorous affirmation and security. When this book was written almost 25 years ago now, in 1961, official or institutional Marxism was already veering towards a systematic philo philosophy of nature. There was a tendency to look on philosophy in the name of the positive sciences, and especially physics, as a framework in which to bring together the results of these sciences, and so obtain a definitive picture of the world. Among the ruling circles, under the influence of Stalin and Zdanov, there was a desire to merge philosophy with the natural sciences in this way, by basing the dialectical method on the dialectic in nature. Why this systematization? Today, although not everything is yet clear, we are beginning to see and know better what took place. One, a deep mistrust prevailed, it still does, with regard to Marx's early writings. The ideological authorities in the Marxist and communist workers movement feared, not without cause, that Marx's thought would be understood quite differently if these newly published works were read. As politicians operating in accordance with those methods of political action and organization which they practiced, they forestalled them. They made their dogmatism more rigid so as to protect it against the impact and preserve it. At the precise moment when hitherto disregarded concepts were being rediscovered, alienation, praxis, the total man, and social totality, etc., and when those who had read the young Marx were clearly were clearing the way for the rediscovery of Hegel, the dogmatists were moving in an opposite direction. They became more contemptuous than ever of Hegel and Hegelianism. They rejected Marx's early writings as being tainted with idealism and as having preceded the formulation of dialectical materialism. They drew a line between Marx and his predecessors and another between the so-called philosophical and so-called scientific works in the Marxian corpus. They fetishized certain texts by Stalin, especially the notorious theoretical chapter in the history of the Communist Party of the USSR, etc. 2. From this, there evolved a simplified Marxism and materialism, reduced to a recognition of the practical and material world as it is, without addition or interpretation. Its methodology also contracted. In spite of explicit classic passages in Marx, Engels, and Lenin, the official Marxists, Marxists contested the validity of formal logic as having come from Aristotle and from the ideological superstructures of ancient or medieval society. Henceforth, the laws of the dialectic could be taught as laws of nature by leaving out the mediation of logic and discourse, and thus passing over the problems with which, or the problems which this mediation poses. It is interesting to note that this simplified ontology of material nature followed other simplifications no less unwarranted. For quite a long period, that of the great economic crisis of 1929-33 to and its aftermath, Marxism had been reduced to a single science, political economy. It had become an, ec an economism. The dogmatists of this persuasion cheerfully rejected the other sciences of the human reality, sociology as being tainted with reformism and psychology as being irredeemably bourgeois. Within this simplification, regrettable factions had already appeared, one which subjected theory to the demands of the practical instruction of the young, another which subjected it to the imperatives of the political situation of the moment. Theory was turned either into an ideological tool or into the superstructure of a particular society. It was deprived of any depth in the interests of a utilitarianism at once constricted and robust. Thus, during the period when specifically economic problems were, up, were uppermost, crises in capitalist countries and the start of planning in the USSR, economism flourished. 
three. But there is another, worse aspect to this transformation of Marxism into a philosophy of nature. It was a massive exercise in diversion. While they were holding forth about waves and corpuscles and the continuous discontinuous objective dialectic and debating these freely, the crucial issues were being lost to view. What was really at stake was no longer in the forefront of the people's minds, which had been led as far away as possible into the depths of nature and cosmological speculation. Stalin and the Stalinists were adept at, at employing these div diversionary tactics. The democratic constitution was solemnly promulgated in 1936 after the murder of Karov. We now know, thanks to N. Khrushchev, that it was Stalin who instigated this at precisely the same moment as the terror was being unleashed. The systemization of dialectical materialism into a scientific philosophy of nature dates from the same period and pursues the same objective, to hide the real theoretical and practical problems. It is perfectly possible to accept and uphold the thesis of the dialectic in nature. What is inadmissible is to accord it such enormous importance and make it the criterion and foundation of dialectical thought. Four, for many and obscure reasons, institutional Marxism refuses to listen to talk of alienation. It either rejects the concept or accepts it only with reservations and provisions. The dogmatists see it merely as a staging post in Marxist thought, quickly superseded on the one hand by his discovery of dialectical materialism as a philosophy and on the other by his formulation of a scientific political economy. To them it seems misguided to bring back the concept of alienation, independently of any idealist systematization or systemization, so, so as to make use of it in the critical analysis of reality and incorporate it in the categories of the social sciences, especially sociology. Or so at least they pretend. Why? Obviously for political reasons which are both short-term and short-sighted. We cannot confine the use of the concept of alienation to the study of bourgeois societies. It may enable us to uncover and criticize numerous forms of alienation of women, of colonial or ex-colonial countries, of work and the worker, of consumer societies, of the bourgeoisie itself in the society it is fashioned in accordance with its own self-interest, etc. But it also enables us to uncover and criticize ideological and political alienations inside socialism, particularly during the Stalinist period. Institutional Marxists choose to reject the concept so as to avoid such risks and blunt its cutting edge. There's no need to stress that I was not fully aware of these related problems when I wrote this book. Nevertheless, it takes as its axis the dialectical movements within the human and social reality. In the foreground, it places the concept of alienation as a philosophical concept and an analytical tool, not the dialectic in nature. It ignores the systematized philosophy of the material object. The concluding and fundamental chapter, The Production of Man, rejects popular economis economicism <laughs> and sociologism, as well as the stress that has been laid on non-human materiality, which is to say that, as it stands, it is tainted only very slightly with dogmatism, and that the author does not hesitate to allow it once again, with all its weaknesses, to be read and criticized. The fact remains that today we can and must reread Marx with fresh eyes, especially the early works, which it is wrong to call philosophical since they contain a radical critique of all systematic philosophy. The becoming philosophy of the world is at the same time a becoming world of philosophy. Its realization is also its destruction, Marx wrote at the time when he was drafting his doctoral thesis on the philosophy of nature in Democritus and Epicurus. In this thesis, he shows that there is a dialectical movement inside each of the philosophical systems he examines, a dialectical movement in their mutual contradiction, 
and finally, in each of them, the objectification of a particular form of consciousness, which can be defined only through its relation to the real world and the social praxis in that real world, in this case, Greek society. Philosophy as such, as the constantly renewed and constantly misleading attempt to systematize and to formulate a satisfactory image of man or of human satisfaction, disintegrates. It is right to take what it proposes into account, but only in order to realize it, a realization which poses new problems. In what was almost the very next thing he wrote, Marx sets out to take critical stock of Hegelianism and shows how this perfect systematization disintegrates. Two attitudes or camps resulted from this in Germany. One wanted to abolish philosophy without realizing it as being a theoretical formulation of man's achievement. The other thought that philosophy could be realized without abolishing it as being a merely theoretical and abstract formulation of man, his freedom, and his achievement. The mission of the proletariat in Germany, but not only in Germany, was above all to transcend philosophy, that is to realize it by abolishing it as such. Just as philosophy finds its material weapons in the proletariat, so does the proletariat find its intellectual weapons in philosophy. Philosophy is the head of this emancipation. The proletariat is its heart. Philosophy cannot be realized without the abolition of the proletariat. The proletariat cannot be abolished unless philosophy is realized. Marx never returned to this theory of the transcending of philosophy as such, taken, that is, in its entire development, from the Greeks to Hegel, either to refute or reject it. In modern day terms, which are not those of Marx, we can say that for him philosophy was of a programmatic nature. It is provided and still does provide man with a program or, if one prefers, a project. This program or project must be brought face to face with reality, that is, with the praxis, social practice, a confrontation which introduces new elements and poses problems other than those of philosophy. This theory was integrated into Marxism since Marx's thought proceeded by way of, ex of successive extensions or integrations to wholes, or partial total totalities, which were increasingly extensive as well as increasingly close to the praxis. No element or moment is lost. In particular, the moment of the radical critique and of negativity, which includes the, cri the critique of religion, philosophy, and the state in general, finds a place in this development and is not re resorbed in the interests of a pure and simple positivity. Marx's thought, therefore, cannot be reduced either to the positivist attitude, which sends philosophy back into a past that is over and, non and done with, or to the attitude of those who perpetuate philosophical system building. At a time when dogmatism is crumbling and dissolving, the early writings of Marx become of the first importance. They enable us to reinstate the problems raised by his ideas and by Marxism, problems which are still fundamentally our own ones.